and my attitude towards uh, people who would identify as same-sex. Um, and both of those challenges were good for me. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that would be one of the biggest ones, I think. Yeah. We can go into that more if you want. Yeah, I mean, uh, is there something that you felt... Um, I guess I get, I, I, I'm a little interested in, in how you think we could interact with those people who identify that way now as a church body. Not, not again, not as, not as just CK press, but I'm dealing with it in a, in a much larger way in the sense that I, you know, um, I think boomers, it's like about one in 50 people or one in a hundred people identified as homosexual, but the Gen, Gen Z is one in 20. Um, and it looks like it's going to continue to increase. And so how do we, how do we, um, maybe invite them, invite them back to church or, um, invite them into a relationship with God? How, how do we, how do we show love and grace, but then also speak truth? There's a lot there that I just said, but yeah, yeah, yeah. there sure is. And, um, honestly, a curious side of me wants to say, why is that? Why has that happened? Yeah. That yeah. It used to be one in 50. Now it's one in 20. Yeah. And um, would love to delve into the sociological and cultural and, and <laughs> all kinds of reasons why that's happened. Yeah. Um, because there's not going to be one reason. Right. Um, in terms of relating to people, mm -hmm. um, the most important thing is to relate to a person, no matter who they are, um, as uh, someone uh, created in the image of God, mm -hmm. um, someone whom God loves. Um, and um, someone that you're called to build a relationship with. Um, and when you build a relationship with someone who's different than you, you don't start off by talking about the difference. Hmm. You try to find things that you share in common. Hmm. And you try to build uh, the friendship and then speak out of the context of friendship. Hmm. And um, in places, in friendships, in any friendship, if you know a person is sensitive in some area, yeah. if they're really sensitive about something, if they come from a broken home, mm -hmm. um, if they um, if they have a sensitivity to talking about the New York Yankees, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, and how they're doing, yeah. um, you know, you're gonna you're gonna at least um, face into that a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, God asks us to be ready to respond to people who ask us for a reason of the hope that we have within us. Hmm. And um, the best uh, relationships that I've had um, with people who um, are uh, would identify as same sex are relationships that um, where they've had to ask me. You know, and people do this all the time mm -hmm. with pastors. You know, they right. give you about, they give you about two weeks. Yeah. You know, and then it's like, okay, all right, we know what you're doing. So yeah. you know, where are you going to stand on this issue? Mm -hmm. And that's too bad because I, really, in my lifetime, we have, we have become a culture that needs to to stand on one side or the other of things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important that we know where the truth is, um, yeah. scripturally and theologically. Um, but it wouldn't have come out the same way when I was growing up right? Um, as it does now. Yeah. And there were some bad things about that, and there were some good things about that. Because you didn't automatically go to, are you a Democrat or Republican? Mm -hmm. Are you mm -hmm. um, a person of color or a person who's white? Are you a person who is same-sex or a person who is, uh, uh, and uses uh, pronouns differently than we do, or, you know... Are you a traditionalist? Mm. And it's really hard for people of my generation yeah. um, that I've pastored to um, grow past their traditions. Mm. Because traditions are what give us a sense of uh, grounding. Yeah. Um, the UK is struggling, and I lived there for three years. And yeah. They're struggling today with the, the death of Queen Elizabeth, 70 years right. of this, this woman's reign as the monarch. And just, you know, the word that they keep using. And I watched about 10 minutes of coverage before I came over because I was prepping a lecture this morning. But I must have heard the word stabilizing or foundation, you know, like 10 times in 10 yeah. minutes. Wow. And um, for a lot of people, um, 
in my generation or older, it feels, you know, kind of like the carpet's been pulled out from under them. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't know where to stand. And if they know where to stand, they don't know how to stand. Yeah. Um, the command is to stand firmly. Hmm. That That's really about you. Yeah. It's not about how you present yourself to someone else. Hmm. You need to be grounded in what is true. Yeah. You need to speak the truth in love. Yeah. And um, you need to, uh, mostly love, I think, waits hmm. um, and is patient. Yeah. It's the first quality uh, hmm. in First Corinthians 13. Yeah. And the word is, is makrothumi in Greek, and it means to, it, it suffers a long time. Hmm. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't particularly like waiting. And so yeah, waiting yeah. is like suffering to me. And yeah. I think, you know, um, that's the reason why it gets translated, love is patient. It's a patient kind, it's a, it's a patience inspired by love that seeks a relationship first hmm. before it seeks to present the truth to someone. Yeah. And when it does, it presents it out of that context. Hmm. That's good. Yeah, I appreciate that. And it, one of the things that I was that uh, well, this will also change subjects a little okay, bit. Okay, different canoe. Okay. But uh, but kind of in the way of thinking about standing firm in the truth, but also people choosing one side or the other. Um, I know you your your PhD was under James Jimmy Dunn, Jimmy Dunn mm -hmm. right? And one of the things that I've been particularly interested in, but also know that probably a lot of people. Uh, part of our church and who, anybody else that's watching this won't have any he idea knows nothing about right. the new perspective on Paul right? Um, which he was I mean kind of the forebearer it seems and then N.T. Wright kind of he made it he invented the language yeah Yeah, N.T. Wright kind of made it yeah. incredibly popular um, so maybe it'd be interesting to, for you to maybe tell us a little bit about what the new perspective is and then I have a question tied to that about kind of sp people firmly standing on one side or the other. So so the new perspective on Paul is um, it is it grows out of, interestingly enough, um, uh, Old Testament stuff yeah. and intertestamental Judaism and research into both of those things. Okay. And um, a fellow by the name of E.P. Sanders um, wrote a, a, a book that, um, you know, when I came through, Old Testament was in a silo. New Testament was in a silo. Yeah. You talked about the way in which Old Testament prophetically looked forward to the New Testament. Right. You made the cross references from the New Testament back to the Old Testament. But now here comes this fellow named E.P. Sanders, and he says, "No, no, these things are are deeply connected, especially when you come to Paul, hmm. um, because Paul is reared in." Um, in Judaism. So let's look carefully at um, the kind of Judaism that Paul would have been raised in. Let's use the sources that come from the time closest to Paul, not forgetting to use the Old Testament. But there's 400 years between the last book of Malachi and the first book in the New Testament of Matthew. Yeah. Four generations. That's like twice as long as America's been a country. Yeah. yeah. So Judaism is going through changes and becoming much, much more diverse in this period. So let's look at that and uh, see what Paul would have would have uh, brought into his life um, as he's growing up a Jew mm. and learning from Gamaliel. Let's look, at, let's look at that closely and see, you know, what that's about. And he goes into this expecting, you know, to find what Luther found, and that is to find Judaism as a religion that um, uh, bases righteousness upon the works that someone does. Mm -hmm. The first thing that he finds out is Okay, if we're going to do Judaism research, let's talk about perhaps the most central feature of Judaism. What makes a Jew a Jew? And um, they would have said immediately one thing. Genealogy. Hmm. Mm -hmm. We're the children of Abraham. Yeah. Everybody, Jew, Gentile, Roman, Greek, um, Persian, everybody identifies themselves in relationship to their genealogy, what family do you come from? Mm -hmm. I remember when I was growing up, it was still really a big deal um, for my mother and father to know um, their genealogies, and my yeah. mother did much better than my father, and <laughs> so because my father really didn't know his genealogy very well, 
if you ask him about it, he would always laugh and say, well, you know, he said there were a bunch of horse thieves in my background, and we didn't really <laughs> keep track of that. But mother knew everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, for people, they would still ask, which family do you come from? What part of the, uh, you know, what part of the country, what, what family do you come from? Yeah. Same thing for Judaism, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So we're children of Abraham. Okay, what's the big deal about Abraham, E.P. Sanders said? Well, God makes a covenant with Abraham. Right. Does Abraham do anything? Um, does he... Does God say, I'm making this covenant with you, Abraham, because you've been a great, righteous person? Right. No, no. he calls yeah. him out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And he says, I just choose to make you and your descendants my people. Mm -hmm. And in particular, one of them. And so that's where Sanders starts off with. Okay, so if um, what Presbyterians call election... Mm -hmm is based upon God's grace and God's gracious covenant, then the Old Testament, which is the Old Covenant, is purely an action on God's part to choose a person from whom will come a whole group of people, mm -hmm. and they are all going to be my people. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, this is really different than most people thought think about Judaism, um, and Luther certainly knows this, so does Calvin, um, but they were in a different context, and their context colors the way they look at Judaism. Hmm. And they're looking at Judaism um, through the lens of uh, Catholicism, yeah. um, and um, so it becomes for them a, a religion of uh, righteousness that earns God's favor. Hmm. And covenant in both of their writings is there, but it's not. it doesn't play a large part at all. Right. And that just tells us all how much our own life circumstances color the way that we look at Scripture. Mm -hmm. And again, we're back to diversity and how that enriches us and helps us see Scripture through a whole bunch of different life experiences. Yeah. So the new perspective on Paul um, says that, all right, if this is, if this is true, then uh, Paul grows up um, knowing that, that he is Abraham's child. Mm -hmm. So nothing can take that away. Mm -hmm. can't take away your genealogy. Um, and so the works of the law um, become the means of the means of um, deepening your relationship with God. Mm -hmm. You come into relationship with God on the basis of God's choice. Yeah. You deepen your relationship with God by paying attention to that choice mm -hmm. and um, choosing to draw near to your father. Yeah. And uh, choosing to do the things that are righteous because God is righteous. And uh, choosing to do the things that are just because God is just. And, and God recognizes and says, like father, like son. Hmm. This is a huge deal in the ancient world too, just yeah. like genealogy is. Um, you're recognized by who your father is. You know, all the time right. in the Bible you hear like, um, Simon bar Jonah, which means Simon, son of a guy named Jonah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Everybody, everybody identifies you by who your father is. Right. And that determines your character because the characteristics of the father are meant to pass and become the characteristic of the sons mm -hmm. and daughters, but it's patriarchal culture. Right. And particularly the sons. So if you are a, um, at 12 years old as a Jew, you become a, a bar mitzvah, which means a son, bar again, of mitzvah, the commandments. Hmm. And if you're the son of the commandments, then you should reflect the character that the commandments are, are teaching you, and in that way you draw closer to your Father in Heaven. Mm. Um, and um, as Sanders says, so this is the way things work. Mm. And basically the new perspective on Paul says that Paul inherited a Judaism that said, you enter into covenant as a Jew through God's grace and election. Mm -hmm. And you maintain and deepen that covenant relationship, just like you maintain and deepen in a covenant relationship in marriage. Yeah by paying attention to, to the covenant hmm. and what it asks you to do. Now, if you flub up, what happens to you? And we get this wrong about Judaism too, Sanders says. Hmm. We think that, you know, Judaism had no way to make up for sins. And, and not true. Right. There's a whole sacrificial system. Yeah. And beyond that, not everybody obviously is going to go to the temple and make the sacrifices. Um, so there are collective sacrifices like Passover, um, for the whole nation, and there also are passages 
Sanders goes back and lo and behold there are passages as you know where you can cry out for mercy as an individual to the Lord and God is merciful so all of the things that seem to distinguish for Luther in particular um, what he read in Galatians salvation by grace through faith yeah that seem to distinguish um, Christianity from Catholicism in the first place and Judaism in the second place yeah they no longer seem to do that and this is called a new perspective on Paul so Paul now comes along in Galatians and says in Galatians chapter 2 when Peter came to Antioch I opposed him to his face um, because before the other people from Jerusalem came he was fine eating with the Gentiles mm -hmm. and when they came he stopped and Paul said you two-faced son of a gun we who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners we know you know yeah but you're not that person anymore your primary identity is not as a Jew or a Gentile your primary identity is as a man in Christ or a you know, if we want to broaden it out. Again, I'm yeah. talking in terms of patriarchal first century culture. Right. A person in Christ. Your primary identity is there. Mm -hmm. You still have ethnic identity. Right. Paul still continues to observe the law. Yeah. But it is no longer the way, it no longer has the function, the exclusive function that it used to have in his life. It's no longer the only way in which you can deepen your relationship with God. And some parts of it are no longer relevant at all. Right. Like the food laws that separated Jew and Gentile. Yeah. That's what's happening in Galatians. And so um, Jimmy Dunn, who was my uh, doctoral supervisor, uh, delivers a lecture on this at the University of Manchester. And he titles the lecture, The New Perspective on Paul. Um, and that's where the term comes from. And Tom Wright, who researches in front of me, two desks, in Tyndale House in Cambridge when I'm finishing up my doctorate. He's finished his and he's writing his first book and um, he is writing out of a perspective of wanting to connect the Old Testament and the New Testament in this way. He reads Sanders and Jimmy Dunn reads Sanders right. and all of a sudden everybody in the New Testament is reading Sanders because, or Christopher Stendhal at Harvard, and everybody's reading um, and saying, yeah, we've missed this. Yeah, And it was new in 1980 right. and um, I'm teaching a course um, called Thinking Through Paul yeah. um, in the spring next year. Okay. And I'll be using a book, and it's written by a guy who studied with Jimmy Dunn. And he says, you know, we should stop calling it the new perspective because it's 42 years old now. Right, yeah. <laughs> and we should go on, you know, yeah. and, and just take this as a given. So that's what's happened in, in studies of the New Testament. Yeah. Yep. Well, so, okay, so I appreciate that. You mentioned a name that just popped into my head. Um, or and pops in my head when I think about this, but you mentioned kind of in your story somebody coming out of an R.C. Sproul group in Philadelphia. R.C. Sproul before he died, and yeah. men like him, John yeah. Piper, yeah. are vehemently against this yeah. new perspective. So I'd be interested in, in Dude, your don't perspective. You, don't you want to know why? On, 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 yeah, why, or what you, what you, why do you think they are? So ask me, ask me any any two people that are closer to uh, the Reformation age in terms of their theological understanding in our yeah. generation than R.C. Sproul and John Piper, you won't right. find anybody. Yeah. They're coming at it from that perspective. Hmm. And um, this is a, a constant debate, yeah. um, too. What, what is biblical theology and how is it different than systematic theology? Yeah. And uh, both of them are coming to the New Testament from a perspective of systematic theology. Hmm. And um, it causes you to be different. Yeah. Um, and so um, one of my classmates in seminary was Scott McKnight. And um, Scott's written 50 books by himself now. <laughs> um, and um, he wrote a book called What Biblical Theologians Wish Systematic Theologians Knew. Hmm. And then he wrote another book called what systematic theologians wish biblical theologians had used. He edited them, he didn't write them by himself. Yeah. And he got people together and you know you could really you can see there's there is an interface mm -hmm. and a difference. And you can choose which which one of those two you want to where you want to come out of as you dialogue with somebody. Yeah. Um, and um, the perspective of R. C. who I still love and John Piper, who I still read from time to time and, and borrowed things from his sermons. Um, great, 
great guys, great theologians. Yeah. Um, but when they come to look at something like this, um, they look at it differently and, and because of where they're coming from. Hmm. Yeah, That's a good... Yeah. Yeah, I've always thought that they were... I mean, I, I read real briefly um, John Piper's article talking about his book that he responded to N.T. Wright uh, with and then N.T. Wright's book on justification and um, it really seems like that in and of itself is the real hang up is how are we, how are we justified through the new perspective uh, how, how the new perspective on Paul sees that yeah. but but yeah. yeah you can definitely see that they're coming at it from two different lenses yeah and it shouldn't be at all because you're both saying justified by grace through faith right yeah yeah. It, it really a lot of it has to do with the, with the understanding of faith too yeah so can I say something about that go ahead yeah yeah <laughs> So faith is this word, um, pisteuo, or the noun is pistis, and uh, both the noun and the verb, um, we translate them as faith, right. great translation. Um, but behind that translation is a, a picture, like Hebrew and Greek words often have, and mm -hmm. we go back to the Hebrew, it would do the same thing. Um, and what you're talking about is interpersonal faith, yeah. faith between two people. And when we talk about faith between two people in English, we don't usually use that word. Right. We can conceptualize it and explain it, and it works. But um, what we talk about is trust. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm trying to think if even the marriage ceremony. You'd know better than I. You just most recently got married. <laughs> anyway. Um, the concept is interpersonal trust. Yeah. And so, once again, start with grace. And, um, gosh, Piper and, and Sproul, right down their alley. Yeah. But now, um, they don't want to make it a uh, work that in any way uh, justification depends upon. Right. But um, go back to what I was telling you about Sanders. And, and if, you're, if you understand yourself to be um, in the covenant because you have been born into a family in the same way that children are born into Abraham's family. Yeah. You've been, you've received a new birth. Um, you now stand in a family in which God is identified as Father by Paul in his epistles. Yep. And um, Christ is, by the way, the, the firstborn son who always holds a, a place of uh, honor within the family and responsibility. Mm -hmm. Uh, and often the father will entrust to the son part of the family business mm -hmm. to run. And um, guess what? The family business is saving a people for, uh, for all eternity. Mm -hmm. So that's Jesus' role, to be the Savior. Thanks for watching. To stay up to date with the podcast and for more content, hit subscribe. And then also hit that notification bell to be notified when we have more episodes drop. Thanks.